Welcome to the session on anomaly detection workflow. My name is Tom Grabowski. I'm the product manager of machine learning here at Elastic. In this session, I'll show you some of our latest features to help you build better, more useful anomaly detection machine learning jobs. I always like to start with our goal on the Elastic machine learning team, which is to operationalize and simplify data science. Operationalize means we build machine learning functionality into the core of Elasticsearch with APIs and machine learning nodes and integrate it all within the Kibana user interface. This is not some side plug in our app. It's built into the core engines so you can get the speed, scale, and flexibility that you expect from the Elastic stack. We also work to simplify data science by providing a clear, easy to use interface that includes wizards and step-by-step -step workflows to build your better anomaly detection machine learning job and the visualizations that make it easy to understand your anomalies and what might be the root cause of them. As many machine learning experts have pointed out, there are a lot more to machine learning than what algorithm you use. You wanna get good results without incurring a lot of technical debt and ongoing maintenance. Although the anomaly detection algorithms are important, they're only a small part of the overall picture. To make use of anomaly detection algorithms, you have to consider the surrounding infrastructure, data collection, feature engineering, result scoring or analysis, and many of the other components that you need to build on. To put an anomaly detection solution in production, consider these requirements. You don't want a lot of false positives, you know, so you need, a very, you need to be accurate, you need to be scalable with the data, you need it to be efficient uh, you know, for the, the hardware that you're using, and adaptable to most any solution, you know, real time as much as you can and be able to look at historical data, you know, generally work with different types of solutions and make it easy to use, not just for uh, the users, but also for the administrator. So I want you to remember these requirements as I walk you through some of the new features we've added. I'm gonna now switch over to my demo environment because it's easier to show you than to tell you how our anomaly detection is improving to meet more of your requirements. In this first demo, I'm gonna show you auto-scaling of machine learning nodes and resources. Um, I'm gonna give you a demo using the Elastic Cloud. Actually, all my demos are gonna be using Elastic Cloud. It's the best way to get started with the Elastic Stack. Um, but you can also do this on-prem with ECE as well. Um, so why don't we get started and I will create a deployment. Um, I'll just give it a name here. Edit the settings. I might pick my cloud provider location, maybe make it a general purpose, latest version. Uh, and really what you got to focus on is clicking on the advanced settings in here. Now, we'll notice that there is machine learning nodes um, available, and I could add capacity here. But the easiest way to add machine learning capacity is just to check this auto scale, this deployment you know, at the top of the advanced settings. You know, and now when we go down and look at machine learning nodes, we see that it's set up for auto scaling. Uh, and what that means, it will add the resources as you need them. So we'll go ahead and create this deployment. Okay, it looks like the deployment has finished. So why don't we go ahead and log into that deployment. You know, once we log in, one of the best ways to add data is to use the sample data. I'm gonna just go ahead and add some e-commerce orders um, data in here, which will um, add some sample e-commerce index for me. And if I want to create some a machine learning job off that data, again, the easiest way is to just click on the machine learning jobs right within the sample data. Take us to machine learning interface, um, just give it a name and create this job. Now, remember, we don't have a machine learning node, you know, or resources available when we created the cluster. And it, it showed us as it's awaiting a machine learning node uh, to start. So what we've done now is, is put in a request to say, we want to start to build a time series model, machine learning model, uh, around anomaly detection. And we would like you to scale that up and um, run the anomaly detection job for us. Um, so if we go back into the cloud interface, we can see the, the new 
uh, cluster that we've created. And we don't have a machine learning node in here yet. Um, so it usually takes you know, several minutes for the um, cluster to recognize the request to create a machine learning node. So why don't we uh, jump ahead again from here to the uh, when the node is created. Okay, so we just saw this uh, new instance added. Uh, we can see it's a machine learning node um, that's, that's getting added right now. We can actually go down and look at the activity. Um, and it looks like it's setting up a new Elasticsearch node uh, for machine learning. Uh, it's just a small one gigabyte uh, node so that we can run or finish running our machine learning job. Um, and if we go back to the node we created, go to anomaly detection, we'll see that it actually has run uh, the, the machine learning job. Um, and we can look at the job messages and see that the job was started, waited, and then it closed. Uh, and so there should be some results. And here for our e-commerce data, we're looking at on um, per user, if there are any unusual users, we see that we do have an unusual user here that was spending much more than a typical user uh, um, on this site. So it did run, gave us some, some good results. And now that the, you know, if we look at the anomaly detection job, now that it's closed and it stopped, um, it allowed that ML node to uh, come up and, and run that for us. And now when it, now that it's done, it'll eventually let go of those resources and close out the ma machine learning node, unless we have more machine learning jobs to run. But this gives you an idea of kind of that auto scaling of machine learning nodes. And if you remember the, the requirements we talked about in the first section, you know, that, that ability of scalability, understanding what it needed, it, it scaled up a small node because it was a small job, you know, efficiently using resources. And you know, from a management perspective, it was very easy to administer. We were just turning on auto scaling for that. Um, so it's a good demo of auto scaling. And you know, we can go back to our deployment, cloud deployments and on to the next demo. Okay, for this next demo, I want to show you how easy it is to set up and create anomaly detection jobs for the users out there that will be using anomaly detection uh, within machine learning and set it up with the various wizards and modules for known data types that we, we've really created for you. So uh, really kind of that ease of use, um, general uh, generalizability and uh, adaptability for the different types of fields and, and data sets that you're looking at. For this, I'm going to use my own demo system here. Um, and when we go in here, you know, I'm already in the um, machine learning option. Um, and we can just go right into anomaly detection. So I, I already have some anomaly detection systems that are running right now, but I'm going to go ahead and create a new one. So yeah, and I do have some data coming um, from one of my uh, uh, Unix servers here that I have. I'll just pick the packet beat data. And you'll see right away when I'm creating, you know, the anomaly detection job, I have a number of options that I can get started with, you know, whether the pre-configured jobs are running on or a number of wizards. If you've used, uh, you know, machine learning anomaly detection in the past, you'll see, you'll know that some of these wizards have been here for a while. You know, your typical single metric and multi-metric where you're comparing a metric to the history of that metric. Um, population job where you're comparing like an entity against other entities. Like for example, if, how is a user accessing um, your system or maybe your application compared to other users of your application? You're not comparing it to the history of that user, you're comparing it to other users. Um, we have a number of other advanced ones for like geolocation and, and other types of functions, but we've really rolled in a couple of new wizards 
uh, in, in here as well. One is uh, categorization. This is if you have a uh, message or text fields uh, like a message field and really handy for like uh, log messages. Log messages have a lot of text, especially machine generated log messages might have specific formats to those messages. We tokenize the formats and look for spikes or dips in the, the message categories. Um, so that's really handy. I'll come back to that in a, in a demo. Um, but one of the newest ones that we've added is the rare detector, or I'm sorry, the rare wizard. And why don't I just walk you through this a little bit? And the rare is looking for unusual rare data on the system. And we can go and, and look at like the packet beat data. I've got a lot of sparse data here. Um, but one of the things I might want to look at is um, if I have any unusual uh, processes, for example, that are, are running in my system. Uh, is, this is just a wizard, step-by-step -step wizard. There's di different options for looking at rare. Uh, I'm just going to use the default one, uh, looking for rare values over time. And I, I'll pick, for example, process name as the field that I'm interested in. Um, we could split it by you know host name if we want. Uh, we could add influencers, what other fields uh, interact with it. I might change the bucket span. You know, this is really a home lab system, so maybe a three hour uh, interval would be the right one. And I'll go ahead and click next. Uh, give it an ID. Uh, so this might be um, And I could put it in a couple of different groups if I wanted to look at, for example, you know, I know it's coming from packet beats, uh, it might be a security uh, to be able to use it in the security UI. Um, and, you know, so I, I've got a couple there that probably are useful. Anyway, I'll, I'll just keep stepping through the, the wizard. It validates um, kind of the data that I'm looking at. I don't have a lot of, of, of specific hosts, but uh, I do have a lot of processes running on my host it gives me a cardinality issue here uh, or warning, which is that's okay. Um, I expect it. I can go ahead and click next um, and create this job. So I've just gone through, you know, step-by-step -step wizard for creating a rare, looking for a rare count or a you know, rare value uh, for a process. Pretty easy. Um, you know, the other wizards are, are very similar step-by-step -step process, but even like if I want to take it to a degree easier um, and adaptable is if you're using Elastic Common Schema, you know, which Packet B does, we could go in when we create our job and say we want to look at the Packet B data again. And we have a set of pre-configured jobs and we're always adding more to this. These pre-configured jobs um, are definitely useful if you're using Elastic uh, Beats or Elastic Agent, uh, End Game Agent. So, you know, we'll give you options for, you know, selecting a set of machine learning jobs. This security one looks pretty interesting to me. So I might click on that one, uh, give it a, uh, prefix and it's got a set of you know four machine learning uh, anomaly detection jobs here for me to run on my packet beat data. Um, I can just go ahead and create those those jobs um, without having to go through any of the step by step configurations. It will go and create um, a, a set of anomaly detection jobs based on the the data that I'm collecting. Um, so again, just another step, easier to get started, uh, works with, you know, Elastic Common Schema, adapt, adaptable to new data sources if you're using Elastic Common Schema, um, and, you know, really is helpful, in, you know, in building that workflow. You can see I've got those jobs that I, I created that have started running. Um, some of them I, I obviously don't have, like, you know, specific, uh, <laughs> too much information on since it's just a lab a Unix server, but um, they have a lot of descriptions and information in here. And I can even go in and just say, well, I've just created those jobs. I have a group of packet beat data. Uh, I can go in 
and look at those uh, the results of those jobs, you know, really quickly as they're getting created. Um, let's just click on all those jobs and go to the anomaly explorer. I can see that I already have some anomalies that have been created for that. So that's just a demo of how easy it is to get started with wizards and pre-configured jobs using the Elastic Common Schema. Okay, for the next part of the demo, we're gonna get back to that log categorization uh, that I showed you earlier uh, in the presentation. And, but instead of doing it from the machine learning interface, we're gonna go down to the logs application and I'm just streaming some data in here through the Elastic Agent, some of it's syslog, some of it's file beat, some metric beat. Um, you can see the stream of log messages in here. Um, and one of the things I wanna start with is just looking at anomalies. So there's an option for anomalies. We click on the machine learning setup. And the first one is just simple log rate. This is just count by the uh, event data set. Uh, this is not categorization uh, yet, but I think, you know, for most users, being able to just get counts on a per application or per, you know, message type is, or can be very helpful. Um, so let's start out with that. Uh, just show you kind of in the workflow of the logs app, we can go in and say, oh, where do we want to start from? I'm going to start, uh, see, just kind of this week create my job. Uh, it'll be on the logs data stream, uh, which is probably the best uh, data stream for log messages. And it's already created the job. I'm already starting to see um, results, you know, and I know that I have some results in here. I just started up uh, a syslog system. So we, sh you know, we can actually drill down into that time range or, and I know that right around here is when I started the syslog server. You can see that um, it's a very high anomaly um, that is starting to get many syslog messages. Um, and you know, you can even go from here and drill down into the anomaly explorer and see kind of that spike backload of syslog messages uh, that were sent via the Elastic Agent. Um, so that's just a count. It's really easy to, to get started with. But let's take a look at the other type of job in the logs app um, called categorization. And here, again, we got to set up the machine learning job. Um, and I probably want to do it, you know, for this week. Uh, just kind of backfill from this week. And, and, and just run when the end times indefinitely means just run it in real time continuously. Uh, again, we're using that logs data stream and we can view these results. Um, now it takes a few minutes to do the categorization because it's, it's really, it works best with kind of that machine generated data that has very specific formats and looking for, you know, tokenizing those kind of formats and variables to tell you when you're seeing unusual messages or a spike in certain types of messages or drop in certain types of messages. Um, so uh, already we've gotten a uh, alert, which is good because it's the, this is the system telling us that it's, we're not getting very good quality results. And we, we might wanna take a look at um, this Elastic Agent data set is you know, giving us too many uh, log formats. So let's go back into that data that creation of the categorization job, you know, start back to this week. Um, and now when we look at the data set, it was problematic for kind of the data that we were looking at. If we go in here, let's not do the elastic agent. That, that's actually the problematic event data set. Probably all the messages are, are, are variable and there's not a very good categorization system for it. But, you know, probably system auth and syslog, you know, we might have better luck with those types of messages. So let's just um, do the categorization for uh, that event data set and recreate our job uh, based on that. So it's nice that the system is telling us, you know, what works and what doesn't, you know, where we'll get the better results. Um, and now, you know, we see that, again, it's, it's going through the system. Um, building the categorization job, this again, could take a few minutes, um, but we'll off, 
we'll we'll start to see some of these anomalies. Um, let's just say if there's anything recent, not yet. So um, we can analyze. We can actually skip over to look at it in the machine learning app um, and look at the group for logs UI and it'll show us the actual couple of jobs that are running here. Um, and they're, they're currently running and they haven't even caught up to uh, real time data yet. So that's going to continue on. But um, one of the things, you know, now that we have it running and we're running in real time, you know, what would be nice is to set an alert for it. So we can go down here to our stack management uh, and into rules and connectors under alerts. And I already have set up a connector for a Gmail alert to give myself an you know, alert when something happens. Um, I can go in here and create a rule. Let's just call it our logs UI uh, rule. Um, give it a logs tag. You know, check every, you know, every few minutes if there's any status changes um you know we want to be alerted on it we have an anomaly detection alert this probably looks familiar for looking at the severity scoring i'm just gonna uh let's see the logs we'll just do it for the um let's just do it for the log entry rate say okay if we see any alerts that or any severity anomalies that are above in a score of 50, uh, let's include the in interim results, which means that if if we're already seeing the um, that the score is going, the severity score is going to be higher. If we're seeing a spike in messages, we don't have to wait till the end of the bucket span to to get that alert sent to us. Um, we can do it on a fifth. Oh, actually, this is for checking the rule, so we might want to look at the last day. Um, well, maybe the last seven days. And we see that there is, you know, we would have gotten alert on this in the last seven days. That was what the alert would look like. Um, so that's good. Uh, and now we can set up what connector type. You know, I said that I had a Gmail alert, so we can use the Gmail connector, send it to me. And with the variables in there and just add that action. So now I'll get alerted if there's a spike in a specific data set. Uh, I could add other connectors type, whether Slack, you know, PagerDuty, webhooks, uh, ServiceNow type integrations. Um, but now I've got that rule set up so I can I can have an alert when when one of those events happens. So that's you know a quick view of the alerts and the logs UI and the categorization of the logs, you know, being able to build that in the workflow, work with other data uh, makes it really easy, really, um, you know, if you think about kind of the requirements of being able to have kind of that accurate, efficient, adaptable to the different types of data, uh, generalizable, you know, timeliness for real time data and ease of use. I think we've gone over a number of those requirements and the features that we've added, and we're continuing to add um, to anomaly detection in, in Elastic. Appreciate you attending the session today um, and look forward to talking to you soon.